Sounds exciting. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Sorry about the bad handwriting. Uh, it's still a font. But um, I, before I forget, many thanks to the organizers for inviting me here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege uh, to be a part of the workshop. Uh, it's also very special because the postdoctoral stint that you mentioned I did here, mostly at CSA. And uh, those were a wonderful three years so uh, that, I'm, that I'm very grateful for. And it's lovely to be back. So um, today I'll be talking about firefighting with critical nodes. Um, so I uh, have a bit of a vested interest in having chosen this because it's a problem that's pretty new to me. And I'm pretty sure most of you uh, know more about it than I do. So I'm hoping that we will have uh, interesting coffee slash dinner table conversations about this and I can hopefully pick up some tips on what to do next. Uh, we just um, worked on this when uh, MS Ramanujan here was visiting uh, visiting us at IIT Gandhinagar um, and this is joint work also with Jayesh and Anirban. So Anirban is also a colleague at IIT Gandhinagar and Jayesh is uh, a graduate student in his group. Um, so Jayesh, a lot of his work uh, uh, a lot of his PhD work is about just understanding temporal processes on graphs and he studies various kind of processes mostly motivated by stuff happening on social networks. He does a lot of work studying Twitter and so forth um, and uh, was during one of his presentations that we felt that maybe we could uh, actually frame some of these processes as uh, something that's traditionally called the firefighting problem and we thought we'll dig a little bit deeper. Uh, MSR on the other other hand, I um, think this is a classic case of uh, when the main tool you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And MSR during the course of his PhD had become something of a specialist in using a technique called important separators. So when we got together, we, uh, uh, we started thinking about whether important separators could be useful for solving firefighting and it turned out that the answer was in the affirmative, which we thought was interesting. So that's the connection that I'm going to try and establish now. It shouldn't take too long, so uh, let's get started. So I'm going to define the firefighting um, game, uh, if you like, or the process. Uh, so as with most uh, of the other talks today, we're going to start with a graph. And this is, uh, imagine a clock running in the background. And at time step zero, one of the vertices, as you might have guessed, catches fire, okay? And uh, it's a turn-based game. So uh, you place firefighters on the vertices of this graph to combat the fire. So in alternate steps, you get to pick a vertex and protect it. So uh, for instance, here, uh, I've chosen to place a firefighter on the uh, vertex that's now labeled green. So you get to in this model uh, deploy one firefighter in one step but this being a very well studied problem people have tinkered with this as well and we will maybe uh, chat about that a bit at the end uh, but right now it's just one firefighter in uh, in your turn in the next step every vertex that's adjacent to a burning vertex that is not protected by a firefighter also catches fire. So the fire is constantly spreading BFS style through the graph. Okay? So uh, for instance here, these vertices now catch fire and now I get to place a firefighter again. Uh, sorry, I'm going to quickly. So that's where I place the firefighter. Uh, and now this vertex catches fire. I place a firefighter there and at this point, uh, you can probably sense that the fire is throttled and it can't spread anymore. So there is no there is no vertex that is adjacent to a burning vertex that's not burning or not already protected. So at this point, the game's done. And these remaining vertices are what we call protected vertices because they kind of were not affected by the fire. So that's the legend. Uh, I'm sorry, I think I got the terms mixed up. So the protected vertices are the ones with the firefighters and the rest are saved. Uh, so there are several uh, optimization goals with this game. A natural one may be to maximize the number of vertices that you save. So place firefighters with the goal of maximizing the number of save vert saved vertices. You may want to minimize the number of vertices that were harmed in the process. And uh, these seem like related goals, but they may end up requiring different strategies. Um, 
You might also want to minimize the number of firefighters that you deploy because possibly you could view this as an expensive resource. And the asterisk there is to just again remind ourselves that you don't have to necessarily deploy one firefighter in every turn. So there are, uh, there are people who like to just optimize the number of firefighters that you have to deploy in every turn, but you can, the total number can be uh, you know, as much as you like. Uh, people also look at minimizing the total number of rounds, so they, it's, this is a pretty destructive game, so you don't want it to go on for too long, so that's something that people consider too. Uh, yet another objective is to think about saving uh, some specific vertices that you really care about, so these could be some VIP locations in your network, and you really, really don't want them to catch fire. So this is mostly the version that we will be concentrating on. And uh, there's been a bunch of work on this uh, prior, and uh, this is one of those problems that tends to be quite hard even on fairly structured instances. So even on trees with constant maximum degree, uh, it's NP hard to save a specific critical set unless the fire starts at a vertex that has degree two, which is a, which is a pretty special case. And there has been some work done on approximation. Uh, but I'll be talking a little bit about looking at this from the framework of parameterized algorithms, where our goal is to essentially come up with algorithms whose running times look like this. Essentially, we are willing to take an exponential or worse sort of a hit on something that we declare as a parameter, and uh, we really want the running time to be polynomial in the total size of the input. So if you haven't seen this before, it may look a little bit funny, but the idea is that think of this as a coping strategy for NP-hard problems, where you're just really trying to formalize the idea of what is the largest class of instances on which I can solve my problem efficiently? So imagine that you have an algorithm that runs in time two to the k times n squared. This is effectively a quadratic running time for all graphs where the value of k is something like order log n, right? So if you have two to the k and k, the, the value of k, I mean, somehow you are in a situation where k is never more than log n, then this is effectively, well, in, this is effectively a cubic time algorithm in the worst case. So, uh, so that's one way to look at it, that, that you're, trying to, uh, uh, you're trying to get an algorithm that, that has a decent running time uh, most of the time, uh, hopefully. Uh, hopefully in the practical situations that you are in, uh, your, your parameter has been chosen so that it is small, small enough for these algorithms to be nice. Uh, so uh, we often call these problems fixed parameter tractable because they are tractable for fixed values of the parameter. It's, uh, uh, it's a slightly ambiguous terminology, I have to admit, because even if you had a running time which looked like n to the k, that would still look like a polynomial uh, bound for every fixed k, uh, except that it's going to be a different polynomial for different k. So that, in our world, is not considered tractable. So we want the polynomial to be, we want, yeah, we want the polynomial to be quite independent of k. We don't want the polynomial bound to change with changing k. And just like in the world of classical complexity, um, uh, we parameterized folks have a hardness mechanism, so not all problems are nice uh, for all parameters. So you can, uh, in some situations, establish that such algorithms are unlikely to exist. Usually you are going up not against P versus NP, but you're going up against ETH. Uh, that's the kind of hardness framework that we have. Uh, we won't really be needing it, so I won't say much more about it, but this is just in case uh, anyone's interested. Uh, so what are the kind of parameters that, uh, that we want to consider for firefighting? There are several natural ones. So for instance, maybe the number of critical nodes is a reasonable parameter. Maybe there will be a few things that you want to save, and you would be interested in FPT algorithms. Uh, maybe, uh, okay, so I uh, heard some mentions of tree width and path width. This is a very popular structural parameter as far as graph problems go. So maybe you want to parameterize by the tree width or the path width or the clique width, any of these width-based parameters. So you're just trying to parameterize by the structure of the underlying network. Uh, maybe you want to parameterize by the number of firefighters. This is what would probably go by as 
what we call a standard parameter, which is essentially any notion of budget, any notion of the thing that you're trying to optimize, when you parameterize by that, that's called, uh, colloquially called the standard parameter. So in this case, I would think of this as, as, as a standard parameter. Uh, and there are several other parameters that we will perhaps come back to later, but let me just walk you through what happens uh, for the first three. So uh, when we talk about the number of critical nodes, it turns out that this problem is as hard as finding a large clique in a graph, which in the parameterized world just makes it an intractable problem. So our hopes are a little bit dashed here. Uh, as for tree width, again, the problem is known already to be hard for trees. Uh, this is, again, when you're trying to save a critical set of nodes, uh, this is, uh, as we've just seen, and be hard on trees. So it's, uh, there is, again, no hope for a FPT algorithm parameterized by tree width because the problem is already hard for constant values of the parameter. So. Uh, so uh, this is also turning out to be a little bit sad. But with respect to the number of firefighters, it turns out that things uh, uh, start looking up a bit, and that's what most of the rest of this talk is going to be about. Uh, and here, uh, uh, as I said, maybe we'll have more to, a little more to say about this towards the end. Uh, let me now talk about uh, separators, which is going to be our main choice of hammer for this problem. Um, so first, let me just talk about x, y separators. So we, uh, we have two typically disjoint subsets of vertices, x and y. And a separator is simply, a x, y separator is simply a subset of vertices, which when you delete from the graph, leaves you in a situation where you can't get from x to y. So there is no path in g minus s from any vertex in x to any vertex in y. Um, we will use this notation to refer to everything that you can reach from x once s is gone. So this is the reachability set of x with respect to the separator s. Um, notice that this yellow box does not intersect with that blue box if s is a xy separator. So you cannot reach y from x once s is gone. Um, so that's the notion of a reachability set. Uh, let me also quickly mention what it means for one separator to cover another one. So a separator T, uh, again, so I may not always qualify that I'm talking about XY separators, so this is implicit, I'm talking about XY separators. So T covers S if the reachability of X with respect to T is a superset of the reachability of X with respect to S. So that's the picture. Um, and this turns out to be a useful concept for defining uh, uh, domination and in due course, a notion of important separators. So we say that T dominates S if it covers S and is also competitive with S in terms of size. Okay? So in this case, T does not dominate S because it's actually a bigger set, but if the size of T is at most the size of S and T covers S, then we say that T dominates S. So this one's doing a little bit better. This one would work as well. OK, so that's the notion of a separator dominating another one, is that you basically, uh, you're as good as the other guy in terms of size, and you leave behind a larger reachability set from the X side. That's domination. A separator is important if it is dominating and if it's minimal at the same time. So uh, again, the intuition here is that, well, between X and Y, when we are talking about uh, folks that are parading as XY separators, uh, we are really interested for various reasons in separators that are as far away from X as possible and consequently as close to Y as possible. Uh, this is just one way to sort of formalize this intuition. Uh, so. Uh, so T is important if it's not dominated by anybody and if it's, uh, if it's also minimal. So in some sense, if there was another separator with a larger reachability set, then that would be the important guy, not the former one in the picture. So that's kind of the, um, it's kind of the intuition. So it turns out that important separators, uh, 
were introduced uh, by several uh, people, but I think goes back to a paper by Daniel Marx when he was considering the multi-way cut problem, which, correct me if I'm wrong, because I always get this mixed up. I think that's the one where you're trying to separate all pairs of terminals, uh, all pairs of K terminals, and I think uh, uh, he was studying the parameterized complexity of this problem, and important separators came up. And it turned out um, that important separators uh, were actually very, very useful for several other problems, which had a cut flavor, which sometimes didn't have one, but reduced, uh, as we saw in one of the earlier talks today, is reduced to a cut kind of situation. Um, one of the famous examples, I believe, is almost two sat, where you want to know if you can delete a small number of clauses from a two sat formula to make it satisfiable. Turns out that one of the best known algorithms at the moment uses uh, important separator machinery and, and so on. So, um, so it was well named, I suppose. Uh, and one of the reasons they're interesting is because there aren't too many of them. So this is, uh, 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 this is one of the really nice things. So the number of important separators of size at most k uh, is, is bounded by a, a function that only involves k and in particular does not involve n. Right. So for instance, in this graph, uh, if you had to count the number of separators between the two black vertices that are of size 2, uh, there would be I don't know, 2 to the n by 2 of them, roughly, because you have to kill each of these paths. Right? And you have a choice of picking one of each of these endpoints. Right. So they're exponential in n many of these uh, separators, uh, sorry, separators of size n by 2, but you'll see that there's only one that's important, the one that's pushed all the way to the right. So um, yeah, 2 to the n by 2 uh, separators if you didn't care about importance, but only one when, uh, when you insist on importance. Uh, this bound happens to be. Uh, tied up to polynomial factors, so you could construct an example which looks more or less like a tree uh, to see that the number of important separators sort of corresponds to the Catalan numbers, so you cannot do much better. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this specific example, but this is just to say that the bounds are pretty much tight. Okay. Um, so um, where do separators uh, and possibly important separators uh, aid the firefighting problem? So, um, so if you think about what's going on in firefighting, you have a source vertex where the fire has started, and you have a set of critical vertices that you're trying to protect. Uh, if you look at the set of vertices on which you place firefighters, then it's fairly easy to check that this is a source critical node separator because if the firefighters didn't manage to cut off supply from the source of the fire to the critical nodes, then you would still have a path along which the fire could reach one of the critical nodes. So this is the first simple but perhaps key observation that, that a solution to the firefighting problem is always a separator of some sort. Uh, but why are important separators interesting? This is going to be very wishy-washy. This is just uh, some of the very early thoughts that we were having when we were hoping to make a connection uh, with important separators. Um, so, uh, so I guess a positive is that somehow, uh, so if we, if we think about separators that separate the source of the fire from the critical nodes that are important, so they're as close as possible to the critical nodes, then perhaps such separators give us some time. So the idea would be to place firefighters on the vertices of the separator. And because they are far away from the source of the fire, maybe we have, uh, you know, this is our best shot in terms of having time to place firefighters on these nodes. They would perhaps survive all the way till the end. On the other hand, uh, because we are, uh, you know, uh, we're kind of obsessed with just using the important separator. We, uh, we may not be able to catch uh, some short paths from 
the source of the fire to the set of critical nodes, which may not be intercepted by our important separator. So I think this is a little easier seen with an example. So uh, let's look at this sort of a situation. Uh, this would be an important ST separator. So let's think of S as the source of the fire and T as the only critical node that we're interested in saving. Of course, you might just uh, be puzzled by the fact that there's only one critical node to save, in which case, why don't we just use a firefighter on that node and be done with it? Uh, you can imagine that this vertex is replicated sufficiently many times for that to be too expensive. It's just that we wanted to keep this example clean. Uh, somehow it's too expensive to place a firefighter on this vertex, so we have to make do with something smarter. Um, if we try to uh, use the important separator, then let's just try and see what happens. So round one, the fire started at the source, and then let's say that we place a firefighter here. I think you, it's easy to convince yourself that, that I'm not cheating by going in a particular order. No matter what you do with the important separator, you're going to run into some kind of trouble uh, with this particular example. But here is one demonstration. So let's say we place a firefighter here. The fire, meanwhile, has touched all of these guys, and now I place a firefighter here. Um, and now the fire is looking pretty dangerous because it's actually hit by now already the important separator. Um, and now, no matter what I do, uh, my critical nodes already caught fire. Okay, so this was sort of, in some sense, a poor strategy, and you can check that this is going to be a poor strategy no matter which order you choose to place the firefighters in on the important separator vertices. All right. So on the other hand, this is not to say that this instance doesn't have a decent solution. This is a perfectly reasonable one that just cascades through this diagonal line of vertices here. So this is just fun to quickly run through. So uh, place our firefighter here. So basically, I'm cutting off the fire at each step just in the nick of time. And notice that I didn't even use a single vertex from the important separator. So that's uh, sort of the contrast uh, in terms of why using important separators is not enough. However, we will see that important separators can still be useful in certain special situations, uh, but that's something we'll come back to in a moment. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about tight sequences because that's the notion that's going to eventually uh, turn out to be useful. So, uh, so again, we are looking at x, y separators, but now I'm looking at a sequence of them in order so this so the first one if you want to be technical about it would just be the the set x but maybe here's the first serious one uh, so the separator is actually the pink set and the yellow set is the reachability uh, the reachability set corresponding to the pink set and um, here's a whole bunch of them and such a sequence of separators is called a tight separator sequence if well if it looks like this, which is to say that the reachability sets are contained in one another, like Russian dolls, pretty much. And also, um, each of these separators are minimal, and most crucially, there is nothing in between that is a, a minimal separator. So if you look at this region here, which is loosely speaking the space between two consecutive separators, there isn't a minimal separator that, that's sitting entirely in this region. So that's, that's why it's called a tight sequence, because somehow uh, when you look at the sandwich between two consecutive separators, you're not going to find any other separators. Okay? Uh, surprisingly, surprisingly, for me at least, uh, as uh, uh, someone uh, was seeing this for the first time, uh, such sequences can, are actually easy to compute. and. Uh, you can actually compute them by just computing a sequence of important separators. So while finding all important separators takes time, if you just wanted to find one, that, that's something that you can work out in polynomial time. So uh, just finding one important separator between x and y, and then recursing by saying, I'm going to look for an important separator between s and y, that's what gives you this sequence. So these sequences are not hard to construct, and they turn out to have uh, several useful properties, and we will 
Uh, we will see in a moment why they're useful for our situation. So before uh, trying to describe the algorithm in the general setting, which I will only sketch briefly, let me talk a little bit about trees because that's where our initial intuition about important separators actually turns out to be accurate. So if your graph is a tree, then um, let's just assume that, let's just root the tree at wherever the fire is starting, right? And uh, so, so I haven't labeled it, so I'm sorry about that, but just imagine that the fire starts at the top. And suppose somebody comes along with a firefighting solution, uh, which, well, if you looked at the vertices where the firefighters are, it's not an important separator, which means that there is presumably another separator that covers the one that you started with. And it's not very hard to see that you can actually push the firefighters from the separator that you started with to uh, the corresponding points on the important separator. And the reason uh, we need the graph to be a tree for this argument to work out is because you can make that association pretty cleanly when your graph is a tree. So there is essentially a unique path from where the fire is to the separator that you started with, which without loss of generality is a minimal separator. So there's just going to be one clean path from the source to every green vertex and one clean path from the source to every red vertex, which is the important separator. And it's not very hard to sort of adjust your strategy so that it settles down on an important separator. Uh, one slight issue with this would be that you are probably not optimizing the number of uh, burned vertices. So by moving to an important separator, you are letting more vertices burn, but it's just that it's faster to find a solution compared to the general algorithm that we have. If we just tried out all important separators and tried all possible firefighting strategies on these important separators, it's just a very simple algorithm. Um, so, okay, uh, let me just... Okay, so I wanted to speak a little bit about the issue of kernelization on trees. So, um, so for any problem that's fixed parameter tractable, uh, the immediate next question that we usually ask ourselves is, does it have a kernel? In other words, uh, can we, uh, so the, the premise is still that we have a parameter which is smallish. And we want to know if we can transform the instance in polynomial time to a different one, which is much smaller. So can we do this quickly uh, uh, to, to be left with a small instance and do it in a manner that, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't disturb the instance? So which is to say, we want a polynomial time algorithm, which transforms our input instance of size n to something that is a pure function of k, something whose size is a pure function of k, and we want these two instances to be equivalent. So this is a really nice formalism for capturing preprocessing, which is something that uh, people in the real world do all the time. We were talking about why SAT is considered completely solved in the real world earlier today. So this is, this is one of those uh, situations where we're trying to come up with an adequate formalism for capturing why certain things work so well. So the, the idea is that before solving the instance, can you crunch it up a little bit efficiently? And notice that the presence of a parameter really helps you build this formalism, because if you didn't have k, just insisting that the size of the instance strictly reduces doesn't leave you with a useful definition because no NP-hard problem would have an algorithm, a compression algorithm like that. Um, so, uh, so the news is, so, so this is, the, the size of the kernel is just the size of the instance that you're able to bring it down to. And uh, as is typical, the holy grail in kernelization is to come up with kernels that are polynomial in size. Uh, so the question is, uh, does, does the firefighting problem have a polynomial kernel, at least when restricted to trees, which seems like a nice, simple case to handle, and unfortunately, the answer here is in the negative. Um, I was going to say a little bit about how we, uh, how we are able to show something like this. What is the framework for showing negative results for the existence of polynomial kernels? Uh, but I think in the interest of time, maybe let me see if I want to come back to this. 
uh, at the end. So, so I'll just say a little bit about the uh, the algorithm on general instances. So recall that we were talking about these tight separator sequences uh, a while ago. So uh, just to uh, just to bring this to the scenario that we are interested in, let's uh, let's just reset x to s. So s is the source of the fire, and y is c. That's the set of critical nodes that we are trying to fight off. Um, so a first observation is that if the length of this tight separator sequence is more than k, where I'm using k to denote my firefighting budget, I'm allowed to place k firefighters. That's my parameter. So if the sequence has length more than k, then I'm in fact done, because that gives me enough time to just place firefighters on the last separator. Because remember that the fire is starting from, from here. Um, so forgive the copy paste error, this should have still been S and C, but anyway, the, the file is starting from here, and uh, notice that because this is a sequence of separators, uh, the file must actually jump through each one of these hoops to reach the critical set. This is like an obstacle course that we have just built and that we are able to see, because if if there was a way of burning a vertex here, starting from here, bypassing one of these one of these guys, that would not qualify as a XY separator, because that would just mean that you have a burning path that that just is not touched by this guy, which is uh, a contradiction to the definition. So so that's. Uh, so that's the situation. Uh, any, any burning path that's trying to get here must jump through each one of these hoops, which means that if we have su sufficiently many of these hoops, then, then we buy ourselves enough time to, to come up with a peaceful solution. Again, this is not particularly optimizing for minimizing the overall damage in the graph. So by just placing firefighters at the very end, I'm really being very partial to these critical nodes, and, and I'm letting the rest of the world burn. Okay, so that's a little unfortunate, but but it works for the, the sort of the formal setting we are in. I'm not sure if I would recommend uh, implementing this as is, but anyway, uh, that's that's an easy situation. Uh, now, if also the size of the smallest separator between x and y is less than k, then, then, then we can reject this instance because, as we said before, uh, the set of vertices that have firefighters on them are legit xy separators, where x is the source of the fire and y is the set of critical nodes. Therefore, if the smallest separator is beyond my budget, there's really no hope for doing anything, which means that the total size of these pink boxes is now bounded, because each one of them has size at most k, plus the number of them is also at most k. So what I'm looking at here is sort of something that's bounded, and bounded as a function of k, and therefore manageable. And now what I'm going to do is what uh, we folks usually do, which is a pretty brutal brute force uh, approach. Uh, so you're just going to like guess like there is no tomorrow. So uh, we're just going to guess what's going on on these pink boxes. Uh, we're going to guess exactly what timestamps do uh, firefighters come on at on these pink nodes? So remember that the pink set is bounded. So if there are, if my budget is k firefighters, that means the total number of rounds is really 2k. I get, I, I, I get to place a firefighter at every odd time step. So the total number of time steps is 2k. And for each one of those time steps, I'm, I'm going to guess in which box does this time step go? Where am I going to place the firefighter? So this is an arbitrary sort of, you know, a sample guess that I've made here. So the first firefighter goes into this box, the second one goes there, and so on. Notice that when I, uh, when I declare a time step uh, as, as belonging to a gray box, I can't pin it because the gray regions are unbounded. So I can't really pin down where exactly the firefighter is going to be. But I do know that the chap's hanging around somewhere here. Okay, So uh, that turns out to be enough because now what I can do is also guess the shape of the rest of the vertices, which are not going to be protected. So I'm not going to be placing firefighters on them, but the pink 
the pink regions are small anyway, so I'm going to guess away even more. So I'm going to say these are the vertices that ended up as burnt at the end of the game. These are the vertices that ended up being saved at the end of the game. The protected ones, we have anyway made a very fine grained guess. We've not only declared that they're protected, we know exactly when they got protected as well. So that's the shape of a guess, and now we're just going to recurse. So we're going to break this down uh, into uh, smaller instances. So basically, if this was, uh, you know, a sequence of Q, uh, uh, this was a sequence of uh, Q separators, then I'm actually going to chop this up into Q instances. Uh, and this is where there's a bunch of details that I'm pushing under the carpet. Um, the, the, the point is that I need to carry over the semantics of my guess into the recursive sub-instances. I also need to make sure that there is some concept of a measure that's dropping when I recurse, otherwise uh, this, is, uh, this is not easy uh, to bound uh, you know, the, the overall length of the process. But it turns out that uh, the notion of a tight separator sequence uh, helps us with the measure. The fact that there is no separator that sits entirely inside a gray box. So remember we said that these adjacent separators are tight, so there is no separator that's sitting completely inside. That is something that, that's uh, useful for showing that your measure actually drops, that when you go inside, you have a strictly smaller budget to work with. And then you have to do a little bit of gadgeting to encode the semantics of these, uh, of these labels uh, to make sure that your solution here actually respects the, the global semantics. So you have to kind of throw in a few pretend vertices which force these guys to take on these roles, and then you recurse further. So it turns out that everything works out. Um, but I'm not going to bore you with, with more details. I think I have just about enough time to make a few more remarks. One is that we also consider the spreading model, which apparently is useful in some situations, where at every step, uh, not only the fire, but also the protection spreads BFS style. Okay? So uh, maybe in some situations that model the spread of disease and vaccination, this is something that's useful, that, that the, the firefighters not only protect the vertex that they're literally standing on, but also, in some sense, the effect of their protection also spreads at every step. So now you really have two competing forces, but it turns out that this model is a little more expressive and can capture problems like dominating set, which are, again, intractable in the parameterized world. So. At least as far as saving critical sets are concerned, this question, which seems very closely related, turns out to have a slightly different complexity. Um, one thing to account for is also, uh, is also this notion of thresholds. So maybe a vertex doesn't get burnt when the fire hits it once, but only gets burnt when the fire hits it multiple times from multiple sources. I'll say a little more about this on the next slide. Uh, so I'll come back to that. Uh, as I've been saying throughout, I'm a little depressed about how many vertices we are burning uh, just to save the critical guys. So, uh, so accounting for multiple uh, optimization objectives simultaneously would be so much nicer. We mentioned a few at the beginning. There are others as well that people like to consider. So I, I mean, there, there aren't all that many algorithms that, that account for, for, for them simultaneously. So this, this would be nice to think about, I think. Uh, when we think about optimizing the number of firefighters per round, so what is the smallest number of firefighters that you need to unleash to achieve, uh, let's say, simply the objective of protecting the critical set? It turns out that that's a completely different problem. So somehow, whatever we said about the, the separators in the tight sequence being bounded, or all of that, at least thinking about it naively, all of that goes out of the window. So, so maybe this requires a fundamentally different approach. So that's... Um, that's, again, uh, one of our open problems from this work. Uh, there was a nice uh, paper called Making Lives Easier for Firefighters, where uh, the authors discussed a whole bunch of graph classes on which this problem is tractable. Yes, this is the last slide, uh, practically. So it would be nice to know if there are, um, so, so there is something called the Parameter Ecology Program, where we want to know uh, is, is the problem also tractable for graphs that are close to being tractable in the sense of typically if your k vertices away from being a split graph, then can I do something that's FPT and k? 
uh, if, what if you flip the goal and you wanted to actually burn as much as possible? This is the situation where the, 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 the process is modeling something like spread of information in a network. So if you're a businessman and you want to advertise on Facebook, you want to start the fire with a few key influencers so that the message reaches out to as many people as possible. And this is where thresholds make a lot of sense. So maybe I'm not convinced to buy something if one of my friends recommends it, but maybe if five of them do, then that flips a, flips a switch. So uh, there's been a lot of study on influence maximization, but not necessarily of the flavor that we have seen here. So that's also something uh, that, that's, uh, I think, fun to think about and discuss. I'm sorry if I stepped over time, but I'm, I'm really done now. So thank you.